New U.S. sanctions on Iran took effect today. Six months after President Trump pulled the U.S. out of the international nuclear deal. The sanctions target Iran's shipping, financial, and energy sectors, all key to the country's already struggling economy. The bombs, which the FBI referred to as improvised explosive devices, were sent to the FBI's bomb laboratory in Quantico, Virginia. We're in Mexico again tonight as thousands of migrants try to find a faster way to the U.S. border. The White House says it's now getting help from the Mexican Breaking news out of Pittsburgh, the man accused in the shooting at the uh, synagogue in Pittsburgh is pleading not guilty, and he also wants a jury trial. You can see he's facing a 44 count. So in the final seconds before the Boeing 737 MAX crashed into the water, it was traveling at more than 500 kilometers an hour. All 189 people on board were killed. You've now entered the House of Mystery. Crime, conspiracy, history, and science. With your hosts, Al Warren, Mike Brown, Julie Saab, Michael Butterfield, Dr. Joseph Usinski, and Michael Hawley. Heard on KCAA 106.5 FM Los Angeles, 102.3 FM Riverside, and 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Uh, welcome back into the House of Mystery, and we're at the interview part of the show. And today we are talking with the author of Zodiac Maniac, The Secret History of the Zodiac Killer, Glenn Wall. Thank you for being here. It's great to be here. Now, Glenn, now this is kind of the second book that you've, um, not so much, it's not so much the first one was Zodiac, but you're kind of following a case, a murder case of, of Valerie... Percy, I believe, in, in the Chicago area. Uh, what drew you to not only writing one book, but two, and being so involved? Well, you're you're absolutely right that uh, at no time, I mean, I was aware of the Zodiac case when I was writing the first book. I was aware that the suspect uh, that is, is what most of the first book is about uh, lived in San Francisco during the Zodiac murders. Uh, and it had crossed my mind that he may have been uh, responsible, but it just seemed um, it just seemed too far out. Just, San Francisco was such a big place; there could it could have been anyone. I really wasn't that up on uh, what happened in those in those cases, so um, I just sort of dismissed it. Plus, I I had plenty of work to do just to try and uh, get the stories from my sources regarding the Percy case in Illinois. Um, so it wasn't until later, significantly later, that I started to think that uh, there were some real connections between uh, him and Zodiac. So we're, now, do you now the, the Percy murder? Um, did you know her, or were you in, involved with the family, or how did you uh, no. get? Well, how, what brought you to that attention? Like, what what made you go oh, and start to look at that case? Um. Actually, uh, I had, as a freelance writer, reporter, covered a few stories for local uh, for local media about the. Uh, you know, I wasn't even aware of it until years later. Um, but during um, one of those stories, I remembered that a former, a very good friend of mine, who was a ne next door neighbor at the time when we were kids. Uh, his parents were very good friends with the Percy's. So his mother was probably the first source uh, for one of those stories. And uh, and when it when it eventually uh, evolved into an idea for a book, um, I was not thinking that the murder would be the center of the book. I was I was thinking more of uh, a, a book about this campaign um, at that time and place, and a murder happened uh, during the campaign to one of the staffers, you know, was Valerie was uh, the, the candidate's, Chuck Percy's daughter, um, but I wasn't thinking that would be the primary thrust of the book. Um, I, I found out later that there just weren't enough sources who were still alive who worked on the campaign, so I sort of shelved it uh, for six months 
or so, and it was only after I, I uh, made another source, which was uh, on the investigative police side, that, that's, that that idea kind of came back or came to life. Wow. So maybe let's let's talk a little bit about that that um, first murder, the, the Valerie Percy. Um, so that I, I've read about it. this is kind of a strange scenario, I think, from the beginning. It just seemed kind of weird to me. Um, so so she was beaten and stabbed in her room, and only her step stepmother was the only one that had any sort of witness of what happened. Um, maybe kind of go over the basic I, uh, premise of that. Right. It was everything was very strange about that crime because it happened at five o'clock in the morning on a Sunday morning in a very small uh, town of millionaires. Uh, not all of them were millionaires, but many were, especially along the lake there where their house was. Um, her father was a multimillionaire. Um, this was in 1966, um, so it was. You know, it was. Uh, I don't. I think Sundays are probably the least uh, days where people are murdered in the United States. Maybe with the exception of one o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the morning, but certainly not five o'clock in the morning. And um, it was just a very strange uh, situation. Mrs. Percy woke up. Initially, heard some noise about five o'clock in the morning. It was a very dark morning. It was overcast. It was windy, um, and she. Uh, heard someone walking downstairs in the house. There were three of her children in the house at the time, plus her husband. She just thought one of them was downstairs, um, fell back asleep, woke up uh, a certain amount of time later, probably not very much later, and uh, heard some moaning, got up to investigate, walked down a hall, uh, heard the sound coming from Valerie's room, pushed the door open, and saw uh, a suspect there, or the killer there, uh, shining a flashlight over Valerie's bed uh, onto Valerie, who was grievously wounded. Okay, so so that 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 kind of in itself seemed weird. So, um, not so much that, but and it was, yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, uh, you know, I think anywhere a home invasion murder would be very strange, and someone waking up and confronting the killer there would be very strange. I mean, it was not a common uh, scenario. Well, not only that, they didn't, it, the, whoever was there seemed to have the intention of killing the daughter. Uh, like, there was nothing mm-hmm. stolen out of her room or the house, mm-hmm. or there was nothing mm-hmm. that he wasn't out to kill the family or kidnapping or anything. So, what did they think about that? Did the police have any ideas on why someone would do that? Was it personal? Uh, there were police, very good detectives, who thought that the nature of the crime was personal. But um, on the other hand, you know, there was a, a case that happened uh, not far away in the 1990s. A, uh, a young woman was found stabbed to death on her parents' doorstep in Glenview, Illinois. And um, so many years later, they had an arrest in California of someone who was tried, I don't know the suspect's name, but um, he, he moved to California uh, to committed two other home invasion stabbing murders and uh, was in the process of the third left evidence behind the victim fought him off and uh, they were able to identify him through DNA this is the one that involved uh, one of the victims out there was the actor uh, Ashton Kutcher's uh, a friend of his or, or someone he was actually going to go out on a date with uh, the day she was killed. So yes, it was very much sort of like that. There was no motive other than someone breaking in to kill someone. So, yeah, because she wasn't raped either. There wasn't a sexual assault involved. Right. And, and so... Right. And they, you know, they, they, they tried to because Valerie and her father were in so many different circles, business circles. They run two statewide campaigns. Um, they had a, a lot of friends. Um, they had to investigate a lot of people. Um, but they didn't come up with a whole lot. Um, the state police found some 
uh, home invading uh, home invading jewel thieves that had mob connections in Chicago. But it didn't really fit that scenario. Those guys broke into houses, stole jewels, and left. They 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 were they had been violent in the past, but not usually with people they were robbing. They were not going to escalate uh, robbery to uh, to murder charges. So and now, uh, her father being a political guy um, and very, you know, fairly fairly high up as well. He even made an attempt for president, I believe. So, so with someone like that, um, could that have been a reason as well? That that was definitely uh, kicked around by by police. Um, he, Percy himself did not believe that, um, and it certainly was. You know, there were all kinds of rumors about Mrs. Percy uh, or about this being domestic violence and maybe her stepmother doing this and Percy being a, a powerful, politically politically connected guy who was running for high office and had a really good shot um, to win, uh, that this somehow was covered up. But I think in reality, it's taken me a long time to understand this, but I think in reality is Mrs. Percy saved everybody else in the house because his intention was to kill everybody. And, and he certainly did do that in other, uh, in other situations. Hmm. So now, now there was um, a neighbor, a doctor, and uh, I've mm-hmm. heard a lot about that and uh, the doctor's uh, notes. Um, now, now, have they ever been released? Do we know what the doctor thought? Yeah, well, the the uh, the full transcript of the doctor's uh, account of what happened that morning, which I think was written two or three days later, um, is in the first book. Oh, I was just thinking of the doctor, and I'm thinking about how um, the doctor's wife um, has talked about her experience of, of mm-hmm. first seeing the. Um, the lights that came on, you know, the, the mm-hmm. privacy lights, you know, whenever someone walks around, you know, and the lights pop up. Mm-hmm. And she saw them, went back to bed, and then it sort of happened again, and there, there was an alarm or something. Why didn't the family hear the alarm or see the lights? Like, I, You know, and I'm, I'm sort of, that's the first thing I thought about. Which family? Uh, the, the Percy family themselves, because it was their house. Like, uh, you know, the doctor's wife looks across and... Yeah, and, and, uh, and I think that I think in those days, uh, what happened was, Mrs. Percy ran back to the master bedroom, and somewhere around there, I think in the hallway, she flicked a switch, which turned on the burglar alarm, which was connected to the outdoor floodlights at the Percy's house. The Hoffs, uh, the doctor's wife, uh, Nan Hoff, ran out the back. Um, at some point after hearing the alarm, and she mentioned uh, in there, or or her uh, husband's account mentions the floods, which were floodlights, but they were actually in the yard in between the two because the Hoffs lived two doors down. There was one neighbor in between, and the neighbor's lights were on. Now, I'm not sure if the neighbor turned the lights on or left them on all night, but that's what is referred to in the account, uh, if I'm remembering it correctly. Okay, so now your your suspect, the person you think um, has done this, um, how do you tie him to California and San Francisco? Well, he moved to uh, he moved to San Francisco in the fall of '65, and was actually living there at the time of the Percy murder, which was in September of '66. Um, so. And his ties to Kenilworth, to Percy's neighborhood, is his parents lived a block and a half from Percy's house. And, and so, okay, so how how do you figure he was part of the Zodiac or murders like that in in San Francisco? Um, in that, like, um, what is it about yeah. him? I mean, well, uh, the first thing that. Um, I'd written the first book. It was done years before. And uh, the first thing that I heard about the Zodiac case is I was watching one of the documentaries. And one of the victims of uh, Brian Hartnell at the Lake Berryessa uh, attack was talking about the way 
that suspect spoke. And that jumped out because uh, the suspect, Thorison, um, had been a uh, had a severe stuttering problem as a youngster, and uh, you know it, he overcome some of it, but uh, you know not all of it, as far as I can tell. So that was the first thing that jumped out. The second thing was, of course, Mrs. Percy didn't get a great look at this guy, but generally speaking, um, and I did know about that that uh, that his uh, height and hair color and uh, and whatnot matched, you know, was a pretty good match for Thorison. And I found out later uh, there were various witnesses that saw Zodiac, and from hair color to height, uh, and then I found some other ones that are even more spot on as far as, like, what his eyebrows look like, what his ears look like, uh, what his face look like. Uh, you know, there are some ones that are uncanny, uh, how close um, they are to to his physical description. And and so, what do you know? Uh, have you found out about this Thorson's? Has it like um, what kind of a history do he have? And does he it was did he have mental problems? Or well, was he... well, to, to to continue on with your first question there, though, um, excuse me for this. Uh, the the other connection after the the linguistic thing was uh, in general description was that when I was reading through the, the uh, pathologist's report on the Lake Berryessa attack, the pathologist said that the, uh, that he suspected based on the wounds that Cecilia Shepard suffered uh, that, you know, it, it seemed like uh, the best guess that he had for the kind of knife was a bayonet. Now that jumped out as well too because of course they found a bayonet in Lake Michigan uh, 800 feet down the beach from from where uh, Percy lived three days after uh, Valerie was killed and the uh, the hilt of the bayonet uh, which you know uh, has these triangular uh, has a triangular shape matched the head wounds that Valerie suffered and talking to the uh, detectives from Chicago and the state of Illinois who'd investigated thousands of murders, I asked them, have you ever worked a case or even heard of a case where a civilian was said to have been attacked by someone with a bayonet? And they said no. And so I said this would be a very unusual scenario, and they said it would be almost unheard of. So there you have, you know, the, the late Berryessa uh, victims being attacked by what the pathologist was almost certain was a bayonet, and you have Valerie... Uh, head wounds matching this bayonet, and that bay that was found down the beach in the direction of the footprints uh, that the first uh, police officer saw that investigated Percy's house uh, the morning of that murder. Hmm. And and so um, about your suspect too, like um, some of his history and stuff. Maybe that would help um, people mm -hmm. understand him. Yeah, uh, well, first, the, the last bit of physical evidence that I would say the tie between the two cases was when I was um, when I was uh, talking to police sources about the Percy case, they talked about how the entry to Percy's house was very unusual, uh, and also to several houses in other crimes prior to the Percy murder, the uh, entry was made at a glass door or a window where this, where a circle had been scored into the glass with a glass cutter, and then what they thought was an X was scored over the circle. And, you know, then the glass was smashed through, and the person reached inside and, and, and opened the door that way. They all thought that was weird. Didn't make, it didn't mean anything to me when I was researching the Percy case. It was only after all of this I have realized that Zodiac's uh, logo, so to speak, or symbol that he used to identify himself in his written correspondence was a circle with a uh, crosshairs through it. So that is, you know, and nobody was really sure what that 
whether it was an X or a crosshair, but I'm guessing that it was a crosshair uh, before he smashed the glass through in those cases. So that's another piece of physical evidence that ties Percy to Zodiac. But as far as his background goes, he had uh, a history of mental, uh, of being, um, I think the first time he was committed to a mental institution was when he was 17. Um, he had a, a very uh, bad relationship with his parents, especially his father, who was the one that committed him. Um, he was a suspect in the murder of his brother, which coincidentally happened almost a year to the day prior uh, to the Percy murder, and which his wife later said he confessed to, was one of three people he confessed to killing. Um, he had a long police record uh, in his hometown. He had uh, run-ins with police in Maine, um, San Francisco, um, Arizona, mm -hmm. bombing, setting off bombs outside of radio station. This is a pretty crazy uh, record. That's just to name a few. Well, I'm wondering. So he he he's he's got all that kind of a background. He's that kind of a person. Um, it seems like um, he was killing randomly, or was he doing it for a reason? Do you think? Well, the the, the wife his wife's book. He admit he supposedly confessed to three murders. His brother, which was to she, he was from a very wealthy family, and he had one sibling. And, you know, my takeaway from, from the brother's death, which was, uh, I believe they tried to make it look like suicide. But according to the wife, he hired one of his uh, uh, associates to kill his brother and then killed the associate uh, the following year, the spring of 66. Um, and that he killed one other associate of his, um, who disappeared, who the wife said disappeared. But there are a lot of problems I have with the wife's book as far as uh, adding it up and making sense out of it. I think there's, I think there are a lot of half-truths, and I think there are a lot of things that, that are not said uh, in that book. So now you're going to take on quite a, um, a challenge in the sense that the Zodiac community um, is pretty aggressive with Absolutely. Um, their suspects, and they're they're not always the nicest. <laughs> um, no, and, and I've had experience with that, and I think what's what's interesting is is nobody wants to argue this stuff with me, which is, you know, uh, unusual, because if anybody else comes up with a theory, they're all over it. And I certain people have made it clear they don't like him as a suspect. They won't go into it. They don't want to debate it. Um, they're... You know, when I first started to suspect him over and over again, I was told by people that they thought he was otherwise a great suspect. The problem was he died too soon, and other letters arrived um, that were deemed genuine by police uh, as being written by Zodiac. Um, but the more that I found that tied him into it, the more... Uh, the more that I realize that those later letters have no evidence whatsoever that, uh, you know, no proof. Some people have said there are a couple things that might be proof, but the more I look at it, if he was the guy, there are a lot of people inside the justice system that would have wanted this buried. Of course, he was dead at that point. But the only thing that could happen by the revelation, uh, revelations regarding him would be bad for uh, say people at the top of the FBI so um, it's I'm arguing something that you know this is a really really crazy uh, outrageous story which seems like there was a big cover up involved well um, and when you say that um, so who do you think is behind the cover up do you think it's just the FBI is that is that sort of your thought um no, not at all. And in, in in the in in what's coming in the additional chapters, uh, the you know in later years, 
the justice system, uh, people in the justice system uh, have been behind it. I think the FBI was the primary, uh, with the primary motive uh, or the primary actor in it. But I think that judges and um, certainly the San Francisco police uh, and local police in other jurisdictions had to carry the water for uh, this. Um, I'm not sure they always knew um, that they were doing this, uh, that they knew what, what was the greater picture and that these other crimes in other states had taken place. But um, I think there's, I think I've uncovered an awful lot of evidence that there was a cover up and there's no other logical explanation for these things. Um, one of the biggest ones was uh, a story that a former FBI agent admitted to in his book out of Chicago regarding the Percy case. Some stories that came out uh, that, the, that the FBI office in Chicago planted. Um, regarding the Percy murder, which make no sense um, given the facts of that case and also the FBI's own documents from late 1966 in which they would show that they believed that Thorson was a prime suspect in that murder. Wow. So now when we, when we look back to California, what about the letters themselves, like the originals and, and the cryptograms mm -hmm. and that sort of thing? Right. So was he capable of doing that and and did you have some sort of evidence that he was the type of person that had written ci you know ciphers and done, been into that or? not until very recently um, except for uh, general suspicion because he was he was uh, he was indicted in the spring of 1967 uh, by the uh, Alcohol Tax Unit, which soon became uh, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, which confiscated over 70 tons of weapons from him, which he had in storage lockers. It's, I mean, here's the thing. He's so, his story is so crazy and so outrageous. I mean, he, he was uh, indicted for... Uh, Arizona wanted to extradite him for bombings, uh, I think, in 64, in... Uh, in that state, he he was. Uh, they were looking for him for attacking a waiter um, in Arizona, um, and so his, uh, you know, uh, and the government confiscated seventy tons of weapons, most of them military, uh, from him, and could not find any links between him and, say, militia groups who his arms dealers were also selling to. They were trying to figure out why this guy had all of this stuff and what was he doing and if you look at Zodiac's letters where he talks about committing huge bombings giant calamities that have killed scores of people those things kind of go together hmm. and, and the ciphering part like the, the cryptograms was he kind of do you know if um, he was trained that, in that or I didn't think about that but I found another case in which police were investigating a suspect who they'd never met and who none of their witnesses who knew about the suspect, who talked to him on the phone, for instance, um, who also had never met the suspect. Uh, they ended up, uh, and, they, and this was a uh, case that happened in Michigan, they ended up contacting authorities in the Bay Area to investigate a secret society who the victim, in one of the victims in this case, uh, had been in touch with, and they were trying to figure out what, uh, you know, what these symbols meant that they found during the course of this investigation. And that is something that, uh, you know, when you look at the fact that the person lived in the Bay Area um, and that this suspect was believed to have lived in the Bay Area, uh, would tie him to um, an investigation outside of uh, Zodiac that um, involved ciphers. But there are other cases. There was a case of a uh, pair of um, a, a teenage couple of high schoolers who were killed in southern Illinois 
in uh, May of 1969, which falls almost halfway in between Zodiac's first and second attacks, a time in which many people have thought he was somewhere up to no good. And in this case, there are numerous reasons to believe uh, this was committed by Zodiac. And I don't think anybody knew of this case outside of Southern Illinois until last year when uh, one of the siblings of one of the victims wrote a book. But the handwriting, and this was this is one of the things that uh, ties that case to Zodiac, I think. Uh, they, the police found uh, one of the victims was bound with the same kind of uh, laundry line that Zodiac tied up the victims uh, at Lake Berryessa. Um, and uh, after those... This, these murders in Illinois, the uh, suspect or the, the killer sent a letter to the mother of the female victim, and as I show in my second book, the handwriting in that letter looks an awful lot like the handwriting on an envelope uh, that was sent to, uh, or that was tied to um, the Sherry Joe Bates case in Riverside, California, which happened not long after Valerie Percy was killed, um, and uh, is long believed uh, is long believed by many to have been committed by Zodiac. San Francisco seems to be the department that is that has sort of been on the forefront of, of things like DNA and and things that we would expect today to be a part of that investigation. And if you look at it between what I found, you know, the, the, the mailings uh, being proclaimed as genuine when the envelopes changed so much, that, that, you know, in that case, you have to say, well, that was really sloppy police work. Why were they, you know, why didn't they have an explanation for this or mention that or disregard these because of that? Um, when they didn't, uh, you have that. You have one of the uh, lead investigators being taken off of that case for forging uh, letters uh, in another case, and you have um, and and you have Tom Voigt on the uh, who runs the Zodiac uh, Killer website saying that one of the uh, retired investigators told him that uh, another investigator in the case uh, confessed to him or disclosed to him that he had uh, concocted or forged uh, a um, postcard believed to be tied to the Donna Last dis disappearance. And Donna Last disappeared after Thorson died. There's really no evidence that her case had anything to do with Zodiac, but the fact that now evidently there's an investigator on record saying that that postcard was forged, at this point, for all of these reasons, you have to be very, uh, you, know, you have to wonder why anybody would believe anything San Francisco has to say about this case. And um, given all of the reasons to believe Thorson was the guy, um, and there are many more, um, you have to wonder, is it time to, to have an independent investigation? Uh, as far as the DNA goes, can you believe anything they would say at this point? And that's what I hope to do: is to push that. And um, you know, anywhere, anywhere, any of these cases can be moved forward. It doesn't matter if this victim was in Illinois or Ohio or Florida, and I found them in all of those places and more. You know, anything that can be done to 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 move those cases forward um, would be beneficial. Uh, in the name of justice. Yeah, do, but do you think it's really valuable to them in the sense of, of money? seems like a lot of police departments, all of them in the states are running as a business, and so it's all about finances. I'm just not sure that they would want well, to, to pursue it. I know, I know that there is a, in the case I mentioned in southern Illinois, that happened right in the midst of the Zodiac cases, there was a, a letter mailed to uh, that police have to one of the families of one of the victims. Have they 
said anything about that DNA. I filed an FOI, you know, Freedom of Information Act uh, request to try and get uh, some information on a phone call because uh, there was, uh, in a very Zodiac-like way, uh, someone called police and took uh, took um, credit for that killing, which would have generated a police report, and I filed a, a Freedom of Information Act request to see that report. They're not going to turn it over. So, you know, these, you just look at it this way. I mean, um, I don't know if you've read the second book, there's another six chapters coming, like I said, nine cases. Um, I believe that he I believe that that he killed at least forty three people in six states, and that's probably being very conservative. And when you look at the reasons why I said that um, you know the, the, the FBI's behave, you know the FBI planning this story in the Chicago press in the early seventies, it's all very suspicious. Uh, as to why they would do this, and um, and there was a an attorney who tried to get uh, this is also in not sure if it's in the first book, but it's definitely mentioned in the second book. An attorney tried to get access to Percy Case documents four years ago that uh, that was turned down. Um, he dropped an appeal, but uh, the judge used. Um, the judge, when turning down that request, talked about how the Percy case was an ongoing investigation. This is a case that had not named a new suspect in 45 years. Um, at the same time, and this is going to be revealed in the new chapters of uh, the expanded latest book, the, uh, there was a uh, member of the justice system in Florida, who fired an investigator, um, I think the state's attorney's office, same year that this Freedom of Information request was shot down in Chicago. And the uh, um, whoever it was in the state uh, justice system who fired this investigator who was looking into this other case, which I mentioned is... Uh, you know, looks to have been committed by Thorson as well. Uh, when there was a newspaper story came out about this firing, and the uh, I think it was the state's attorney uh, who who did this firing used the same language as the judge in Chicago the same year, saying it was an ongoing investigation. Once again, this was another case that happened in '66. So we're going back now. You know, they were going back almost 50 years at the time said the same thing about an ongoing investigation while firing this guy who was looking into the case. So I find that extremely suspicious that these two different members of the justice system in different states, same year, while, you know, while quashing investigations, one of them independent, one of them in, being conducted by an insider, use the same language when these cases are cold as ice and have been for decades. Well, but, but, but what do you think the big picture is? Like, where where is this coming from? Um, well, I think that what happened was, I'm not sure if I said it in the first book. I, I probably did. M what I take away from all of this is that Thorson, Thorson was, uh, Thorson killed dozens of people. And the FBI believed he was a prime suspect in the Percy murder three months after Percy was killed. They didn't share that information with anybody in uh, Illinois State Police, Chicago Police, Kenilworth Police. Um, they were secretive in the way that the FBI has been. Um, and, you know, it could be argued certainly that uh, that did not help. That secrecy did not help. And if it turned out that he killed dozens of people after that, that would have looked awfully bad if this was revealed at any time, including now, um, though it's ancient history at this point. But I believe that, you know, J. Edgar Hoover did not want that out. Um, his head would have been on the chopping block. I mean, Valerie Percy's father, uh, five weeks after the murder, became a U.S. senator. This is not a guy to be toyed with. 
he was he he was would have been able to have uh, you know major heads rolled uh, in many places. So you've got to ask yourself why was Thorson uh, paroled early, uh, bonded out of jail after violently assaulting two different people at two different times in two different places? Um, had it had you know they tried to extradite him from San Francisco to Arizona on bombing charges. He was able to fight the extradition successfully, by the way, by hiring uh, Melvin Belli, who Zodiac wrote to in the middle of his, you know, killings. You know, I mean, there's so much there that implicates Thoris, and it's, you know, it's crazy, which is why nobody's going to, to argue any of this with me. I think they're probably doing their own investigations of the guy. So, well, I just, I but I wonder if Senator Percy, why he didn't pursue it further. Well, I don't know what Senator Percy knew and when. Uh, I know that his, I know that Valerie's twin sister did a, did her own investigation. She doesn't want to talk about it. Apparently, um, she doesn't want to talk about the results of that investigation. So, but when they learned these things, um, is comes into question because you have to remember, Thorson died in June of 1970. So they only had about, I don't know, was that three or four years? Yeah. Um, so once he was dead, what are you going to do? You're going to sweep it under the carpet? The only thing that, that can happen is they're going to find out who these judges were that bonded him out, that, per that gave him early parole, that didn't require him to go. I mean, this would have looked horrible. This would have This would have caused people to lose their jobs in high places, in multiple states, you know, in many places in the justice system, and so it's it's an it's a you know, like you know, when you're doing these investigations, every answer you get picks up two more questions, and that's why there's a lot more for people to look into. But uh, you know, and you have to wonder, can San Francisco be be uh, trusted with Zodiac when? Uh, you know, when this guy apparently was mailing his DNA all over town, you know, um, and suddenly they can't figure out anything about it. They can't, you know, they can't get a good, they can't get a good sample. So, uh, you know, that's all I can do is just dig up everything I can dig up and put it out there, and, and there's plenty of room for other people to go. Um, but people have found it interesting. And, uh, when, when does the new new expanded version of your book come out? That possibly very soon. The the, um, the copy has all been approved. It's all being laid out. The cover is being revised. Um, so as soon as it you know as soon as it takes for me to read through six chapters after it's laid out, and then. Uh, it has to be uploaded and it has to be approved by Amazon, which just takes a few days. Sometimes, sometimes less. I have to get the uh, I have to get some information to the cover artist from Amazon. So possibly quite soon, possibly before Christmas. I'm pushing it as fast as I can. But as far as all the hard work, you know, other than proofing, uh, I have and I have proofed the document that they use to make. You know, drop into the layouts. So I just have to make sure that it's it was done right without you know, any errors. But it's it could be quite soon. Should be quite mm -hmm. soon. What he did, I think, what he did, not as Zodiac, far exceeded uh, what he did as Zodiac, as far as carnage, as far as the outrageousness of some of these cases. Um, you know, it's truly. You know, one of them is just beyond belief, uh, what I think happened. And that was the one I told you about where they were looking, the symbols came into play as part of the investigation. So, but, you know, we have to remember that in those days, what did, what did, what did most even state police know about the, 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 the phrase serial killer? The term serial killer hadn't even been, you know, forged yet. I don't even think that came up until the 70s. Um, studying people who kill just to kill, 
Um, that doesn't mean that there weren't cops who were aware that there were people who would kill just to kill. But I think the, the general knowledge of it, um, I don't think the FBI even started really invest, you know, putting it, uh, putting people together to, to study these kinds of criminals until the 70s. So it's interesting looking back. Um, but I think that, I think that what happened was, is when Thorson confessed, he confessed to it all, which is why his wife killed him. And, uh, but, you know, and there are a lot of holes in her story. So I get into a lot of that in the, in the book. Um, so it's, uh, I don't know, I don't know where it's going. All I can do is push it as far as I can and hope that, you know, other people find merit in the arguments. And, um, well, I'm, I, you know, I'm, not really, I'm not really, uh, like I said, I, haven't, I know about Zodiac, but what I know about Thorison outside of Zodiac, so, uh, you know, is so much wilder than, than what he did as Zodiac, so I don't really respect any of that. I mean, I respect the work. A lot of people have done really good work, and I've, you know, I, I think I've built on that. But, um, you know, uh, one thing that's going to be in the in the new part is what's long been known about uh, the Lake Berryessa attacks is there were three witnesses who saw him and observed him for I don't know a half hour or so before uh, before he attacked uh, at Lake Berryessa and their uh, their description of him is uncanny. When you, uh, I mean, you can look in, if you look in Web Sleuths, if you want, I don't know if you ever check the Web Sleuths site. No, not too much. I, I, um, no. <laughs> if, if you check there, you'll see there's a thread in the Zodiac file called Don't Count Him Out. It's usually up about four or five from the top. And you can see everything I've posted on there, and you can see photos I've posted of him, and you can see. And the last thing that I posted, which is going to be in the book, is is about the description of this suspect, Lake Berryessa, and it's unbelievable. It was these three different witnesses who saw him, and I mean, they said he was between six feet and six feet two. Thorson was six feet one. They said. Uh, he, he didn't wear glasses, Thorson didn't wear glasses. They said he, they believed he parted his hair on the left. He parted his hair on the left. He had dark brown hair. Thorson had dark brown hair. They said he had straight eyebrows. I've posted a picture of Thorson. Uh, you can look at his eyebrows. They talked about his small ears. They talked about his round face. Um, you know, uh, it is, it could not, you can't even imagine that these people could have had a closer, more spot on, uh, um, description of him and um, they were incredible witnesses and you just go down the line with all of this stuff um, that there's not, there's not even you know I started one thing I started to do is I started to look at some of these other suspects about you know about this case and I just laughed because there's so little to them I mean there are things that point directly at Thoris one of the, one of the most uh, damning is after the last Zodiac murder, when they were searching for him in the park, um, north of the crime scene, uh, Zodiac wrote a letter afterwards talking about that. I think it's in the bus bomb letter. And he talks about, he has a line where he says, the dogs never came within two blocks of me and they were to the west. And by that he meant the police canine units that were searching the park. And if you look at a map and where Thorson's house was in Pacific Heights, it's exactly two blocks east of where they were searching in that park at that time. I mean, there's, you know, so I don't know uh, how long it's going to take people to realize this stuff, but it's pretty hard to argue with. Yeah, you know. So. But, but I've got a thread in there. I've I put together a picture of Horison next to the sketch that you might find interesting. I've got the story of those witnesses and a picture of him in custody in 1967 in Las Vegas. Uh, and you can compare 
that picture to their description, things like that. So I've posted quite a lot of stuff, and it's been crickets from from the Zodiac community. So I don't know. I consider that to be a good thing. Uh, yeah, you know. Cyphers gave me the <coughs> Cyphers gave me a, a mention of my book and stuff, but he was funny because you know I talk about him in the. Um, I talk about him in the uh, thread that I told you about because I said that when I told him about Percy and the connections between Percy, he said he didn't have any problem with my work. He just simply refused to believe that any other cases would come out that Zodiac would have done. And I said, that's funny because so many people who studied Zodiac have always assumed that he was somewhere up to no good between the times that he attacked in December of 68 and he didn't attack again until July of 69 and they've always assumed that and then of course I found that book and I show up the writing samples from that case which reeks of Zodiac uh, that's the one that happened in southern Illinois and uh, you know once again these guys just don't want to talk about it and he said he has no biases he'll he'll examine anything and I'm like well that's a bias right there you have a bias where you refuse to believe any case no matter how substantial you know uh, points to Zodiac you refuse to, to entertain that there's some case out there that somebody doesn't know about in a case where people have always assumed that there were cases out there that they didn't know about so that's just kind of funny but you know he gave well, me that's, that's Orin Chuck and he's um, he's uh, he's really strictly into um codes and, right, and right. ciphers and all that. He doesn't really care right. who you say it is. Um, right. So, you know, he's kind of right. not that's really... And, yeah, and, that's and not. I think that it's going to be interesting when when the additions to the book come out and it talks about this other case. And, uh, and, and because there is a tie into that. And that's the only one. I mean, there are all these other things. Uh, there are these that pop up in these different cases, um, a red sports car, which was tied to the Percy case. Thorson drove a, a red Ferrari. Um, you know, witnesses who were or suspects who were seen staring at the at the residence where the crime happened a few hours later. Um, witnesses who talked about a suspect who spoke in an unnatural way. I mean. You go down the list, you'll see it. I mean, I don't want to give it all to you now, but it's it's <laughs> going to be interesting. So, what do you what do you hope um, to get um, out of the book? Like, so is, is there a point to writing the book, and is there something you want people to get um, after they mm-hmm. read it? Well, I think that uh, you know you talked about how the Zodiac community. They've been around for a long time. People have studied those murders for a long time. And I think a lot of people have bought into certain uh, aspects of that case, like the later letters. And, um, and uh, which I think I could give you a lot of reasons to doubt. Now, another thing that's interesting is, is, like I said, I would talk to people about Zodiac and Thorson as a suspect, and they would say, yes, but there were these later letters that came, and they were deemed to be uh, genuine and whatnot. And finally, at one point, I realized that the first letter, the first mailing to arrive after Thorson was killed, which was about 16 days later, the envelopes to that, to that mailing and to uh, three others that followed over the next year and which were all deemed to be genuine by police, the envelopes to those mailings uh, veer wide, widely from uh, Zodiac's MO in two ways. Number one, all of the mailings that he had sent to police prior to that, and when, when Thorson was alive, contained two, two stamps, double postage. The first one and the three that followed only have one stamp, and uh, also all of the mailings that were sent while he was alive had some sort of notation on the envelope with the word 
uh, editor, rush to editor, attention editor, and whatnot on the outside. The editor notation disappeared at the very next letter, just like the extra stamp. No one has had an explanation for that. Now, also, just so happens at the time, uh, the the first letter that changed in the envelope with the single stamp and whatnot. At that time, right when Thorsten dies, there were no more sightings of Zodiac, there were no more attacks by Zodiac, and there were no more phone calls by Zodiac. So, you know, make that a, make of that what you will. I find that to be uh, all of those things to be proof that it was him. Hmm. Well, that's pretty interesting. So now, do you have a website and a place that people can find you or find out more information about your writing? Um, I think uh, the books have been, you know, reviewed on Amazon and on Goodreads, and certainly I'm I'm on social media like like uh, a lot of people, Facebook and whatnot. Um, those would probably be the best way, unless they reach out to you. Well, we will have your book. Um, actually, I'll get them both up on our website so people listening can find you with one click. Easy and, um, uh, well, fantastic. Um, we're glad you came on the show. Um, our guest has been Glenn Thank Wall. The book is called Zodiac Maniac. Um, thanks for being here. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.